Well, health, happy Father's Day weekend. It's so good to be together. Do we have any dads in the house? Would you stand up, dads, stepdads, granddads? Stand up so we can honor you this morning. Thank you. Thanks for being here this morning. Well, as you can see, we have something a little different planned for you this morning that we're excited about. We're going to do some panel discussion uh, and then a closing message. So I'm joined by three incredible dads here who will introduce themselves shortly, who will be sharing about their fatherhood journey. Now, we hope this also becomes a broader conversation for all of us about how to positively impact the next generation, right? Because we all have an opportunity for, for influence, right? Whether it's your own kids, whether it's stepkids, whether it's grandkids, whether it's nieces or nephews, whether it's neighborhood kids, or whether it's friends' kids, we all can impact the up and coming generation. So with that, let's pray together and we'll jump into the panel discussion. God, we thank you for your promise that you will meet us here just as we are, but that you won't leave us as we are. God, so as we all come together th this morning to seek what you have for us, I pray that you would reveal to each and every person in this room and in the overflow exactly the right next step you want us to take in this area of relationships and the next generation and living a life of gratitude. God, we pray that you would just illuminate how you want us to walk in that after our time together today. We thank you for being a good, good father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so let's start with introductions. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jason, and I have the privilege of serving as the executive director at DRCC. My family and I moved close to two years ago now from Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, to Frederick. I'm married to my wife, Stephanie. We've been married for 14 years, and we have two incredible kids, Caleb and Hannah, ages seven and four. Caleb's headed into second grade, and Hannah will be headed to preschool in the fall. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, good morning. My name's Chris Moody, and I've been married to my wife, Wendy, for 23 years, and we have seven kids. Uh, the oldest is 20, and the youngest is one. She just had her first birthday two weeks ago. Nice. Um, and so my o oldest is Soren and Jackson, and then Karis, Anders, Josiah, Lincoln, and Tirza. Great, thanks, Dave. Very good. Hi, my name is Dave Satry, and I've been married to my wonderful wife Linda for 29 years this month, mm -hmm. and uh, we've, uh, we've got a, a lot of children mixed in there. <laughs> so uh, they go from 27 to 7. So we have first five are boys: Josh, Ben, Sam, Nate, and Jake, and then Sophie came along, our first girl. We've got Luke and Levi following that, twins, and uh, and Katie and Asher. And as is common, uh, more people start showing up in families like this in many ways. So uh, in, the, in that picture, you've got Tanner on the left. He was deployed out here to the East Coast and uh, met his fiance, Paige. So that's nice. Uh, our oldest two are married. So Josh and Morgan are expecting a baby coming up this fall. And uh, Ben and Ariana, we have three grandkids, uh, Eli, Toral, and Jessica. And framed, I guess, that with uh, with some parents, both on, on Linda's side and my side. And we've got... Parent, grandparents and great-grandparents uh, providing a lot of prayer support there. You can see lots of experience going on up here on this stage. <laughs> Lee, you want to share yep. about your family? Hi, I'm Lee McMillan. Uh, I'm a single dad. Not for long, though. I'm getting married in October, but um, it's yeah. my beautiful family there. I got LJ is my oldest. Uh, twins that are eight, Colton and Easton, and Caden will be my stepson. And my lovely fiance, Liz, is there as well. Um, I'm a father of two special needs kids. My son, LJ, has autism as well as apraxia of speech, so he has a lot of difficulty communicating. Um, my other son, Easton's twin brother, has autism as well. And it's, it's been a very humbling road that I've been on, uh, trying to do that as a single dad. Um, I have the most weekends, a lot during the summer holidays as well. So it's been a, it's been a challenging experience. Uh, by the grace of God, an angel came across my path, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm getting married to her, thankfully. But uh, wow, that's <laughs> awesome. make me blush. Awesome. But uh, in dealing with special needs, it's, it's, uh, it's a handful. It's, you can't just go to the movies. You know, we, we can't just show up to church whatever service suits us. Um, we have to come when the Haven has their ministry on Saturday nights. And I'm here now because some really kind folks 
um, were kind enough to watch my kids while I come up here and share a little bit. And mm -hmm. that's a testament to what kind of place we have here in DRCC. If you're out there and you need help, there's somebody here that will get you help if they can't help you themselves. And this is that kind of place. So I'm really thankful, you know, for this family and my Haven family. Mm. Thanks, Lee. Nice. So glad you could be a part. Yeah. What's even more amazing about Lee's story, as I've, as I've gotten to know him over the past couple of weeks, is not only is he a single dad, but a, a single dad with no immediate family. Both his parents passed, and uh, he was an only child. So just mm -hmm. amazing courage and strength. And you did hear Lee mention the Haven ministry. So for those of you who might be newer or who may not know what Haven is, it's a ministry that we run on Saturday nights uh, during our Saturday worship service in the gym for any families dealing with special needs challenges, right? It's a safe place where folks can come together, dive into scripture, play games together. It's a family and safe environment. So if that's something that could meet the needs of you or your family, I encourage you to check that out. All right, so let's jump into the second question. So with it being Father's Day weekend, if you could tell us about an important father figure in your life. Lee, why don't you lead us okay. in? Okay. Well, my dad was awesome. Uh, he was a big, strong, John Wayne, old school type guy. He taught me how to fix a ton of things, um, instilled responsibility, hard work, and I'm really thankful for that influence. Uh, but if I'm going to speak on a parental influence, I would have to go with my mom. Mm. She was a single mom, and it was just me and her. So our Thanksgiving, if you can imagine it, is table set for two. That's it. Mm. But uh, that's... That's how it was for me, and we had a really close bond, and she instilled, you know, the moral compass I have. Um, we served at church from a young age, and we're involved with, you know, trying to grow, th grow through Christ as long as I can remember. She was all five foot three, but she didn't play, <laughs> and I knew my job was to make mama proud, and that's, that's the way it was, and that's what I did my best to do. Um, she had the perfect mix of being a disciplinarian, um, showing by, by the example that you know she had, as well as just loving the heck out of me. I mean, if you asked any of her friends, she would promise that the sun rised and set on my goofy self, and you know that made me feel pretty darn important. It was uh, it was a real blessing to have someone like that in my life. She taught me a whole lot about what it means to be a Christian and what it means to to serve others. Mm. Great. Thanks, Lee. Dave, why don't you tell us? Uh, for me, that is my dad, Roy. Uh, he happens to be a, a pastor. He's retired now and still serves from time to time. Uh, but it, uh, importantly, it was not just his walk of faith and his biblical knowledge and that kind of thing. That's great. That is a really critical factor in terms of his spiritual influence on me. Uh, but beyond that, it was certainly his personal relationship me, with me, the love and support that I have. And so uh, that's, that's been really impactful, that individual relationship. We like building things together and doing things like that. And those are equally as important, uh, really from a spiritual journey as well. Uh, and I experienced the same thing from my father-in-law, John. He's a, a vested, you know, you've got two vested father figures that are, that are uh, pushing toward your own spiritual growth. So it's really meaningful for me. Great. Thanks. Chris, how about you? Yeah, well, when I thought about this question, the first person I did think about was my dad. And uh, my dad has this amazing ability to extend true Christ-like grace, especially to people who, mm -hmm. who really need it. And he just gives it so freely. And he's a tremendous, tremendous encourager. Mm -hmm. But as we were talking about this, another man had come to mind, and I was trying to figure out who do I talk about. Um, this other man was named Rich Ovenshane. And then suddenly, two and a half weeks ago, he passed right. um, very unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of time to reflect. And um, just as I thought about that, uh, what I thought was, you know, there was this man who he was married. I met him in college. He didn't have kids at the time, but through the course of our life, he ended up having kids. But he just poured so much deliberate time into me and others as well. It wasn't just into me. Um, but Rich had this ability to see what was inside of me, what God had put inside that I didn't know was there, and to draw it out and to nurture it and then to give me the opportunity to like learn it and practice it. So he would give me opportunities to lead groups or oversee projects or different things. And so in many ways, he helped draw out you know, the things that God had put inside of me that I didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing that he did really well is he just gave me a very clear vision of what it looks like to, to be a man who follows Jesus 
and how to do that, like very practical day-to-day -day kinds of things. So I'm really thankful for you know the, the 30 years I had with him. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing. And a, a good reminder of you teachers, coaches, parental volunteers with community organizations, you can leave a lasting impact. So one thing I want to mention, if you look in your bulletin, we do have an insert uh, for this morning's service. And on one side, it will track with our closing message on the shoulders with giants, but on the other side, it's blank. So as we get into our panel discussion, if there's an idea or a thought that gets sparked in you, maybe it's a potential next step in a relationship that you have with someone, feel free to use that bulletin insert to, to jot that down and to remember it. So a key part of our children's ministry and our youth ministry pathway strategy is to equip parents to be the primary spiritual influencers of their kids. Right? We love having them for an hour program during the week. It's our honor to do that, to do, introduce them to Christ and to grow deeper in Him. But we recognize that's not enough and that they need to, they need to learn of spiritual things at home. And we want to come alongside parents and grandparents to equip you to do that. So guys, um, what role have you taken on in being the, uh, you know, a primary spiritual influencer with your kids? And what approach have you taken? Um, we, we work uh, to drive spiritual training. And you are, as parents, the primary spiritual trainers for your kids. That's going to happen uh, by proxy, really. And for us, that means... Uh, working to instill habits, to, to do prayer time, to ensure that we uh, spend time. We're big on reading. Uh, my wife has led a big charge on reading in our house, and we read and read more. Reading scripture is critical. Reading other stories, to tie that together for your kids, of other people's Christian Walker experience. Chronicles of Narnia, uh, there are missionary stories that tie together the experience of people. There are individual stories with their walk. Uh, uh, Running for My Life is a story about a runner named Lopez Lamont. You know, you can hear, there's all sorts of things you can sort of instill in an everyday way with your kids uh, through that exposure to, to scripture and reading. Uh, serving is another big aspect of what we do. Uh, Haven, Haven needs people. Uh, out. <laughs> children's ministry needs people. Michael Ute, who you saw before here, he can connect you to that. And there are so many opportunities here at our church. We have an upcoming uh, planned event uh, on June 29th. There are so many other opportunities that we have along the way, though. Some of those take shape in things like uh, there was a Neverland production last year, and there are upcoming events that are either individual serving. There are spontaneous events. We, we lost some trees in a storm, and not surprisingly, Chris Moody and his family showed up at our house. It's hard to know what was better, getting the work done or spending time serving, though. And those are, those are the things that bring us together as a community and helping your kids understand their passion and capabilities and how they can use their gifts to serve for Christ and serve and live out that will that he has for them is such a critical thing. And it's been, uh, it's been rewarding to watch our kids grow in that way, to see them go on an impact trip or see them go somewhere where they've got skills before I teach them many of the times and then being able to work together with them as well. Yeah, great. Chris, would you mind sharing? Yeah, so I was thinking about it. I think one of the things I try to do, um, the, the most important thing, and I don't do this well, but is really to pursue Christ in a way where that's your, your life's priority, um, to order my affections around what he desires, you know, love what he loves, hate what he hates. Um, and I don't do this perfectly by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that's part of why it's, like, that's important that I don't do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. I think that gives our kids a model to see what does it look like to live following Jesus. And so if um, in the good times, they see that. And when you struggle, they can see that as well. And well, what do you do? How do you get back on track? How do you get back up? Um, that type of thing. So doing that in a transparent way, being deliberate to live transparently with your family. And, uh, you know, if, if Jesus is my greatest love, um, it's, he's much more likely to be my kid's greatest mm -hmm. love. There's no guarantee in that. It's not a formula. But um, I think that's probably the best chance I can, you know, the best way I can influence my kids to be able to walk with Christ. Um, the other thing I try to do is to connect with my kids and and to connect with them in a way that um, where we can build a relationship where we can talk about anything. Um, so fun things and be goofy, but also uh, be more deliberate about serious things um, and ask a lot of questions and, and build times where outside of the fun, we can get into more spiritual conversations um, 
And in that, not tell them what I think or what I think I know, but, but more explore that with them, almost discover with them mm -hmm. who God is. Um, and, and that happens. And very often, the, your kids have much more mm -hmm. profound things to say than you thought. So um, just some practical ways as I was thinking about it. As a family, we really try to worship and pursue Christ together as a family. It's not like I have my relationship with Jesus and the kids do. We try to do that together. Um, and so we make weekend worship together a real priority. Um, yeah. And DRCC has been really great for that for us. And we try to be very deliberate about engaging about what's talked about at church or in a, you mentioned books and books mm -hmm. that we might read or podcasts that we've heard, but engage in those things together as a family. And we do that around meals, when we're in the car, whenever we might have um, free time. We typically end the day all praying together um, sometimes right. that's hard, but we've made that a practice. Um, and the last thing is we've really tried to have our kids be involved in the greater church community. We've, we've seen that as being really instrumental in helping their, their faith grow. Great. So let's pick up on your last thought. So part of the DRCC vision statement is to strive to be a community of light, right? And, and we strongly believe that we were not created to go it alone but to do this journey together in authentic community. So let's talk a little bit about the role of community outside of the home in your, in your kids' lives and the importance of that. Would you mind sharing your experience there? Sure. Um, we, we are blessed with a, a tribe of mentors and leaders around our kids uh, in this church and in other churches. And, uh, and as, as parents, as fathers, we have the opportunity to connect with our relationship and bring those to light. Uh, for example, you know, Chris and I happen to be in the same uh, men's table. I, I've got friends sitting right here who are in that same table. And the opportunity to, for us to develop those relationships, connect through serving to our kids, and to encourage our kids to mentor, uh, to, to seek mentorship and, and to be mentors. Through these relationships for us, we have had people who have taught my kids things that I might not be able to get through to them on. We've had people who are uh, connected them with, uh, with job opportunities, with all sorts of things in every aspect of their life, performed with them, served with them. And some of them are uh, older people mentoring my kids. Some of them are peers. Mm. Some of them are right there together with them. And that's the benefit of building a community like that. We have the opportunity to learn from each other. And this is a two-way street. So uh, I, I have so much to learn from my kids. And uh, as you're sitting next to younger people or older people, depending on which side of the spectrum you're on, that opportunity for learning from that intergenerational relationship is so powerful. And that's what will build this church. And, and going forward, it'll build every church is to have those connections, both peer level and kids seeking guidance from, from people who've been there before. Mm -hmm. That's great. Chris, you want to share? Yeah. Uh, Wendy and I just feel so strongly that this is important um, and um, that there are adults outside of the home who are speaking into their lives. And uh, my oldest son, Soren, uh, as he was going into his senior year, he had the opportunity to go to this uh, Christian boys camp called mm -hmm. Deerfoot, and they had this discipleship program. And when he got back, so he went to that for the summer. When he got back at our old church before we moved up to Mount Airy, we had a new youth pastor. And this youth pastor immediately connected with Soren, and Soren and Reese spent a, a good amount of time together. And at the end of his senior year, Soren came to me and said, you know, Dad, um, we had noticed that his faith had truly become his own and was really just, he was ready to launch on his own in his faith. And he said to me, you know, um, at Deerfoot and with Reese, it's not that they told me something you had never told me before. I know I had heard it all from you before, but in those relationships, it finally made sense. And I was sharing that with a friend of mine. He's like, man, well, doesn't that bother you? That, and I was like, no. I mean, it was so great that I was so glad that there were men in my son's life who helped bring that to fruition. So I just, I think that's so important. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So at DRCC, we have been studying some research coming out of Fuller Theological Seminary in California, and they have a whole institute dedicated to understanding family dynamics and the faith of youth. And they've come out with some research to, to better understand the high percentage of high schoolers that are leaving the faith post-college, right? It's somewhere up towards 70% of high schoolers who have a faith and who attend student ministry are leaving the faith and walking away from it post-college. And what can we do about that? 
And one of the key findings that they've come out with is a common denominator of those students who have stayed the course and who's, um, where their faith has become their own has been the amount of intergenerational relationships in their life. Those mature um, Christian adults in their life speaking into them, doing life together, and they targeted um, kind of the ideal ratio as five to one for every one student having at least five mature adults speaking into their life, you know, including parents. Um, again, just speaks to the importance of all of us playing a role, regardless of your age, to, to be able to speak in and guide the next generation. So as we all know, parenting is a journey. We're all kind of students in this process. And we all have areas to grow as parents, as dads. So if you guys wouldn't mind kind of taking down any masks and, and just getting real, you know, where do you find yourself struggling as a dad? And maybe where have you had to apologize before as a dad? Well, I can take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to my fiance, I was able to uh, help coach my uh, son's baseball team. My future stepson and my son Easton uh, were on the team. And Jiminy Christmas, I tell you, he, he, didn't, he has not picked the game up naturally. I kind of did, not to toot my own horn. But I really had to step back and, and, and not get frustrated with him um, and, just, and just try and teach him and make it fun. And the competitive side of me, I had to kind of just put in the back seat. And, you know, after one of our first games and he struck out, and I was like, Ethan, you got to do a better job. you got to keep your eye on But I kind of saw that and then stepped back. And then the next time I was like, just have fun, buddy. Just yeah. have fun. Yeah. And... It took me a little while, but I'm, I'm still working on that. That's, that's something I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need still prayers for, Boy. but I'm getting there. Youth mm. sports know how to test your patience. Whew. Anyone that can vouch for that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. What else? Any other experiences you'd like to share? Yeah, I had asked my, uh, my kids um, when we were preparing for this, and um, when we talked about the discipleship question, I asked them, well, what have I done to help, con you know, help you with that? And they talked about really connecting with them and, forming the relationship. I would go with walks on, take them places. And, and uh, so that was really good to hear. But I really struggle with being deliberate about connecting with my kids sometimes. Um, sure. You know, I'm, I'm just a really selfish person. Um, and so taking the opportunity when I have free time to, if I've got a project to do around the house, I can do it myself in 10 minutes or I can bring a kid along and it's going to take a lot longer, but that connection or running out to the store or that type of thing. And so that's, um, well, it was great to hear my kids say I connect well. I really do struggle with that. Mm. Um, and when I was asking my kids about that, you, you asked about the time you had to apologize. Yeah. I was trying to think of some, and, so, and my kids were there. So I'm like, hey, guys, you know, I'm, I'm preparing for this. What's, can you help me remember some times? And it was crickets. <laughs> and, and I was having trouble, and I realized that is not an area I do well and an area where um, that's really missed opportunity, I think, to model mm -hmm. healthy relationships. So um, it's one thing I realized even from this, this morning <laughs> that I need to work on. Yeah, thanks for honestly sharing that. You know, both um, Dave and Chris attend a men's table. Uh, you, you heard Dave mention that earlier. I just want to encourage all of you guys, if you're not in community, we can't do this alone. I know we tend to think we can or desire to. We have more than 12 men's tables meeting out in the community throughout the week, day and night. Uh, I would encourage you to check out the groups page on the website. We have mixed gender groups. Ladies, if you're looking for community, we have women's groups. Um, don't try to do life alone. We want to come around you and support you in that. So I encourage you to check out the groups page on the website. So let's head into our last question. What final piece of advice would you give dads and parents or anyone who has influence over a child or youth? Well, we know that the upbringing of our kids is just so important. Um, so setting that example at an early age is just so imperative for them. And I, I like to think of it as, you know, preparing them for that next chapter there in their, in their life, you know, adulthood, being on their own. And I think of it as an offensive playing football. You know, you, you, you teach them right, you teach them to walk with Christ and those morals associated with that, you know, and that they're, they're ready to be grown up. You can hand that ball off out of the backfield. You have a high percentage play. And, you know, I'm not saying the destroyer is not going to come and try and slow them down or knock them down, but they're going to be more inept to avoid that 
with, with that upbringing as opposed to just teaching them manners and loving them. And well, you do that, you're sending them for a Hail Mary 50 yards down the field, not the most highest of percentage play for success. So just setting them up for success to be the best they can is real important to me. All right. Yeah. Dave? Um, this is in large part what I need and, and what they need. Uh, I, I had a verse that was, became pretty meaningful in this, uh, in this journey for me, and that is Hebrews 12.5. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Uh, and that is something I need. I need that learning. I need that discipline and that learning in order to... Uh, to take on that encouragement. And so even when I don't feel like I am equipped, and there are many days where I don't feel like I'm equipped uh, to, do, to do fatherhood well, uh, I need to, to ensure that two things happen. One, I take courage and take uh, encouragement from Christ that I can do that. Uh, and then to be sure that you know, we talked about apologies, we talked about standards. Mm -hmm. I need to ensure that my kids don't think that I, there's some standard of perfection. Mm -hmm. So I certainly don't have it. I need redemption the same way they do. And that has mm -hmm. to be a clear understanding because um, I, I think sometimes kids can see parents with, as, as having some sort of level of uh, ability or capability that they can't meet. And that's never the case that we should, re, you know, we always need to help them understand that we need Christ the same way they need Christ. Being present with my kids, uh, engaging in the little things along the way, engaging in individual, you know, if you have a, uh, I mentioned if you have a note writer, if you have somebody, one of your kids, I have two kids who love to do projects together. I have kids who just love to play Frisbee together. Whatever you do, engage with them and be deliberate about that. Uh, thankfully, wisdom builds over time. As, as fathers, thank the Lord that I've had 27 years to, to improve upon this, and, and I hope to have a whole lot more. So uh, knowing that, that's encouraging to know that where we are, it, it can, can always improve. Speaking love into our kids and empowering them uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, being deliberate about that, that with each individual and recognizing their talents and capabilities. If that's a performer you have, if that's a, 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 an academician you have, if that's it, whatever they're good at, speaking love and capability and how they can use that to glorify God is, is uh, important. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a little bit about how our church grows and more on that community. We have young people lining these rows right now, and you're probably sitting next to one. Mm -hmm. It's so important that we enable that and encourage that and speak truth and positivity into that because they will lead in the future. It's mm -hmm. our role and it's our, uh, it's our privilege to enable that and to help them achieve their skills and capabilities as best we can. And we need to embrace that. As fathers, for example, we, we're, we play a big role on whether they'll continue to attend church. And so reinforcing that and really connecting them with people so that one after the next, and I, I, see them, I see my kids' friends, I see uh, kids I've had in Sunday school, they're all future leaders ready to serve. Great. That's a good thought. Chris? Um, I think, again, one of the most important things c can be that uh, as dads that we just press in and pursue Christ and connect with him. Um, you know, the good news is he wants to connect with us and, and that he'll empower us with what we need to be a good dad. If we want to be a good dad, I, you know, I think of the verse, you know, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all this will be added. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best ways we can become and grow into being a good dad is to connect with our father and allow him to, to work inside of us. Um, I think the greatest gift we as dads can give our families is to pursue Christ. Um, the rest will sort of fall into place. Um, and to do that with your spouse, with your wife, and, and if you're not married now, but you potentially do in the future, to from the very beginning to do that together. Um, and I'll just reinforce what was said about the men's table, you know, the water boys table and other men, finding men who can help you do that. We're not meant to do this alone, and I don't know that there are good dads who are isolated. Mm -hmm. I think most good dads are probably connected to other men. Um, another thought that I wanted to share is... Um, if you're like me, you fail a lot as a dad. Um, don't let failures stop you. Yeah. A failure does not disqualify you, um, even a really bad failure. Mm. So get up again. And if you haven't been a good dad, there's no better time to start than now. Right. Um, and I think, again, as if you're connected with Christ, he can empower whatever it is, however 
you know, whatever relationships need to be changed, he can make that change. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to share is really something that God is challenging me with now. It was something before Rich passed away that I was challenged with, but as Rich passed away and reflected on him, I realized even more that what God was challenging me with was something Rich had done. And that's this idea of, of seeing our kids and seeing what's inside of them and calling out what, what God has made and put inside of them. Um, he's made them to know him. He's made them um, with potential, with gifts. Um, and so to be able to see, you know, my son has a tremendous spirit of generosity and to, to recognize that and, well, how do I help him draw that out? Or they have a leadership gift. Well, how can they nurture, you know, how can we nurture that and give them opportunities? Um, but also to let them know they were made to know Jesus, right? And to speak that into their life and call it out. Um, I think that, that doing that can, uh, as you were talking about, the ki our kids are going to be future leaders one way or the other, and so we want to be deliberate in helping them to be that. I don't know where I heard it, but someone said that words are like seeds, and those seeds can take roots in our souls, right? I mean, that's, words are pretty impactful to us. And so for our kids, we want to speak words and cast vision of who Jesus is and what life might look like with Jesus, um, but not just generally, but for them specifically with how God has wired them. Um, I think if we do that, you know, we are empowering them to really do well into the future. Awesome. A good word to close on. Let's call out the potential of the next generation and cast that vision for what it looks like to love God fully and to serve others. Can we thank Dave, Chris, and Lee for participating in the panel? Thanks, guys. We're grateful for you guys. And at this time, I'd uh, ask everyone in the auditorium as well as the overflow to tune in to this three-minute video. I just love that clip. What a powerful demonstration of love and compassion. You know, I can see it now. The dad leaps up out of the stands, has to get through probably one or two barriers, leap a fence or something, push away the security guards. This is an Olympic race to be with his son who's struggling. What an amazing demonstration of love. Wow, and what an incredible picture of God's love for us. We sang the song, Reckless Love. A God who wants to relentlessly pursue us and be in relationship with us. Wow, I want to meet Derek's dad. Incredible. And there at the end of the clip, you could see Derek leaning so heavily on his father's shoulders, barely even able to stand upright. The pain in his face. The theme for this weekend is on the shoulders of giants. You know, this phrase is said to have been coined by Isaac Newton in the 1600s where he said this, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And the intent of that statement was that we can only plow new ground, gain new discoveries, because we're building on the discoveries and the trailblazers from the past. You know, the old African proverb says this, if I stand tall, I'm standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. You know, Derek Redmond in that clip was leaning so heavily on his father's shoulders just to stand. So today, we're here to honor and encourage those male role models who have and continue to influence us. So I have this question for us today. On whose shoulders do you stand? What male influence is in your life right now that you can thank for steady support, wisdom, encouragement, and maybe even sometimes correction and accountability? You know, for some of you, it's really clear. It's your dad. He comes right to mind. You know, but for some of you, that's not the case, either because your dad has left this earth or maybe because your dad wasn't the giant that you needed. Maybe it's a grandfather, an uncle, a cousin, a brother, or a friend. Take a look in your bulletin with me. We have a gray note card in each of your bulletins. Take that out, raise it up so that I know that you have it, 
I want to make sure that it was in your bulletin. Good, raise it up. Okay, I have an assignment for you this week. This is the practical application from our time together today. Would you commit to writing a note of thanks and encouragement to a man who has heavily influenced you? And if it's a guy who has specifically supported you in your walk with Jesus, tell them. Let's soak someone in gratefulness. Tell them how they've pointed you to Jesus. Now maybe for some, this would be a reconciliation moment. You had a father figure, or maybe you have a son or a daughter, and you've drifted. And maybe you're not even on speaking terms, and it's painful. Maybe this week is a reconciliation moment. You know, Jesus reconciled us to God and then gives us the mission of being ambassadors of reconciliation. Is God calling you to a bridge building moment this week? I get it. It's hard. It takes two. But would you take a step of grace and humility? God can do a lot if someone's just humble, if we're just humble. So maybe for you, there needs to be some reconciliation to restore things. For some of you, you may be in a stage of life where you don't have older male influences. So I ask this question, who's standing on your shoulders? And would you commit to writing them a note of encouragement this week to spur them on? You know, I've attended a couple of funerals lately and it's such a potent reminder to not let things go unsaid. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Will you commit to writing this week? Let's read this verse from Hebrews up on the screen from Hebrews 10. Paul says here, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds and encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. That word spur one another on means to incite or provoke someone to take action. What a better way to spur someone on than through words of gratitude You know, Paul says this to the the church at Philippi at the beginning of the book of Philippians. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. How encouraging is that? You know, we learned last weekend from Rajendra that part of the secret sauce to living a joy-filled life is living a life of gratitude. You know, research tells us that the best relationships have at least a five to one encouragement to criticism ratio. Gulp. How much encouraging are you doing in relation to your criticism? Let's be people of overflowing gratitude. Will you commit to writing this week? Now, we couldn't talk about standing on the shoulders of giants without talking about the ultimate giant, right? And that's Jesus Christ. And we stand on his shoulders, Let's read this from Romans 3. Righteousness, which is right standing before God, is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference who you are, where you come from, right? All have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. But we are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Listen, we don't just stand on his shoulders. We stand on his outstretched arms. We stand on his nail-pierced hands where his battered and bruised body. We stand on his sacrifice that took place on the cross for us. And by his wounds, we can be healed. Listen, some of you need to hear this today. Maybe you don't know God in a loving and personal way and you've never experienced him in that way. And this Father's Day is just kind of, well, I don't even know what it means to have a good and loving father, but know this, you can have hope today. You can have joy. You can have fulfillment and a purpose. You can have peace that surpasses all human understanding. You can have a relationship with the all-loving creator God who pursues us. I want to share this passage in closing. I really love this, especially the version in the message. Um, You know, the writer, Paul, is talking about all of those giants of the faith who have gone before us, all those giants in the Old Testament. And he talks about Jesus. Take a look at the screen. I love how the message puts it. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we'd better get on with it. 
strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, whatever. And now he's there in that place of honor, right alongside God. So when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that litany of hostility he plowed through. Now that should shoot adrenaline into your souls. Does that shoot adrenaline into anyone else's souls? That we have a savior who's gone before us, the author and perfecter of our faith, Let's stand on Jesus. Let's strip off what's weighing us down. And for some of you, there are relational issues that are weighing you down that you need to make right. And maybe God's calling you to make those things right this week. Let's run the race set before us. Let's pray we're able to provide the shoulders that others can stand on as they run after Jesus. So will you write that letter this week? Don't let things go unsaid. Whose shoulders are you standing on today? And who's standing on your shoulders? So let's commit to writing and being overflowing with gratitude this week. As we wrap up, I have three things I want to mention. The first is I want to echo what was shared in the announcements, that if you are new or just visiting today, we are so grateful that you decided to join us. I would encourage you to text the number in the bulletin, text welcome to say hello and to get connected, or join us at the Welcome Center after the service. We'd love to get a gift into your hands. You know, the second is we're here to pray for you and with you. So if you have a prayer need, we'll have prayer ministers up front who would be more than happy to pray with you. Maybe this message struck a chord with you and you know there's reconciliation needed in your future and you just don't know how that's going to happen. We would be happy to pray with you as you face that and seek to take a step towards reconciliation. And third, I just need to say thank you Did anyone see the bags of food out in the lobby? Did did anyone catch all the bags out there? Thank you. Thank you for your generosity to fuel the Mount Airy Food Bank where they, believe it or not, they feed over 100 families who live right here in our own backyard in Mount Airy. And their shelves go empty this time of year. So thank you for dropping off that food in the back and serving our community. We're so grateful. Let's pray together as we close. God, we thank you for the men in our lives who have supported and pointed us to Jesus. And you, God, if, if, it, if there wasn't a, a male influence in our lives, we thank you for those female influences in our lives who has pointed us to you. God, I pray that you would use us to encourage those influences this week. We're reminded that you told us in your word that the world will actually know we're your followers by how well we love one another. God, help us to show our gratitude to others If reconciliation is needed, Lord, I pray that you would miraculously make a way. And as much as it depends on us, God, help us to take a step of humility and grace. Would you guide us? And we thank you for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you that we can stand on his shoulders, his nail-pierced hands, forgiven and infused with abundant life and new hope. May we walk out of these doors just overflowing with gratitude and joy because of what you've done for us. And may that spill over to others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Father's Day weekend.